Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the Late Night Hockey Draft Preview Show. I'm very fortunate to be joined by Brock Auden today of OHL Prospects and McKean's Hockey. Brock, thanks so much for joining the show today. Thanks for having me on, Stephen. Yeah, it's a busy time of year for you, especially someone who his focus is in prospects. So this time of year is definitely your biggest time of year. And how did you start getting into prospects work, Brock? How did you end up in this crazy hockey prospects world? Yeah, I mean, it is kind of a niche market, right? Um, well, when I was trying to figure out what it is that I wanted to go to school for back in, in late high school, um, I kind of had my path narrowed down to two options and education, which is what I ended up choosing. Uh, and then sort of hockey journalism was, was the other one. Uh, so in order to build a portfolio, as, as you know, uh, I got a job covering the OHL for hockey's future. And then from there, you know, just built up connections and, and kind of developed a real passion for covering junior hockey. And while I did go to school for education, that passion sort of never went away. Right. And, um, started up OHL prospects as a way to sort of scratch the itch of, of covering the league and covering junior hockey. And then it's sort of developed into to other things like writing for McKean's, which is great. Yeah. I've been following your work for a long time, especially when I was covering the Barry Colts back then in 2015, 2016, always following your work and keeping up to date with it. It's, it's great great work i always love reading what you've put out there especially i checked out and everyone i encourage you to check out brock's latest blog over on ohl prospects about the top ohl skaters entering this draft class and now digging into this draft class brock this is one that a lot of people have dubbed as one with a lot of middle six forwards a lot of middle pairing defense missing some of the flash sizzle and pop that we've seen from previous draft classes now do you see this the same way as everyone else has kind of been writing this draft class to be? Yeah, I think it's a very fair assessment. I think anytime you see a draft that has some sort of indecision over who goes first overall, yes, Owen Power seems like that likely choice. But all year we've been hearing about, you know, Ben Years and uh, William Eklund and Simon Edmondson and other guys pushing for that number one spot. Anytime you sort of hear that, it's usually because the year is not necessarily a down year, but a year that lacks that, for lack of a better term, potential superstar. Um, and I think that you sort of hit the nail on the head. I think you've got a lot of players who are probably going to have very long NHL careers, uh, you know, some very good players, but I think it does lack that guy who's going to be your Sidney Crosby's, your Connor McDavid's, your Austin Matthews. I don't know if there's going to be a, a real superstar that comes out of this draft class. Um, you, you know, there probably will be one or two guys who, who end up achieving maybe more than we're expecting. But at the same time, uh, as of right now, uh, that assessment is consistent and it's one that I would agree with. Yeah, we've been spoiled with recent draft classes too. I'd say you look at, you know, obviously the McDavid Eichel at the top, you've had Austin Matthews, Patrick Lyon, the one year, even Jack Hughes, Capo Caco, they haven't maybe met their NHL potential yet, but that was a very highly touted draft class, not to mention last year's with Alexis Lafreniere going right at the top. So maybe we've been a little bit spoiled lately as well with the, the high end talent. But like you said, you see there that there's a few players that can have really good careers and long NHL careers. Now of this crop of players, looking to enter the NHL in this draft class, which ones do you see having the most high-end skill or maybe the most upside come the NHL? Well, just to add to your previous point too, I think another thing that sort of hurts this draft class is it's sandwiched in between some really good ones. Um, we looked ahead to next year and we've got Shane Wright and uh, a whole host of other players who have a chance to be superstars and Connor Bedard in the future and Matvey Mishkov. And there are so many players you know, who look like potential superstars in these next two or three years. Um, and then we have this draft class. So yeah, it, it, obviously when you're, when you're forced to make those sort of comparisons, it's going to look not as good um, when they're side by side. Right. Um, to answer your question, I think the guy that probably has the best chance of, of being a star is William Eklund. And I think that's why we're seeing him mentioned as uh, a potential choice, even for Buffalo. I don't know 
uh, if they've made up their mind yet. And obviously there's a lot of rumors that Buffalo is very interested in Eklund, whether that's at number one or whether that's acquiring a selection sort of in that top five or top seven to try to secure his rights as well. Um, but you have to look at him as a, as a really highly intelligent play creator and someone who probably has the most upside of, of any offensive player available. There are some other guys like Ken Johnson, who's, you know, a, a potential top 10 selection who has a very high ceiling, but also sort of a low floor too, right? Um, and that's sort of the other thing that makes this draft class very interesting to assess is there are some higher ceiling guys who could develop into NHL superstars or NHL stars, but they're, they have a lot of risk attached to them. Uh, Johnson being that, you know, he's not the best skater. He's a bit of a, a perimeter player compared to some of the other uh, players available. So Eklund is probably that safe bet because, you know, he's pretty polished in terms of his two way abilities, a really high end skater, uh, really thinks the game well and has already proven that he can play against men in Sweden. So I think that there's a lot going for him. And I think if I were to, to hedge on one particular player being that star, it would be Eklund. Yeah, like you mentioned too, playing in the pros in Sweden, that's such a big plus for his prospect profile. So maybe something that the scouting evaluators in Buffalo, as you mentioned, potentially is a team. They, they've got that Jack Eichel trade still looming. It hasn't happened yet. Maybe they are able to get back into the draft in that top five range, in that top three range. Uh, sounds like you're very high on Eklund. So definitely a, a team and a player to watch out for. Also keeping an eye on and in and around the first round of the draft. Is there someone who you think is being slept on a little bit, someone who you've seen pushed down draft boards that maybe shouldn't have been pushed down as much as they have been? Well, I'll give you two choices. I'll give you one from my region, Ontario, and I'll give you another one from, uh, from a different region from, from Ontario. I think it's Ben Goudreau. Uh, I think that if the OHL had played this year, I think we'd be mentioning him in the same sort of breath as Wallstead Casa uh, as, you know, a potential top 20 selection. I really do believe that he's in that same category. I think we saw that at the under 18s where, you know, he was the top goaltender of that tournament and was fantastic for Canada. But, you know, that was the only place that he played this year, right? And if we're just assessing him off of his U17 season with Sarnia where you know, there were some consistency issues. The team itself wasn't, wasn't great in front of him. And I think he's progressed a lot, but there is going to sort of be that uncertainty given the small sample size of just basing your evaluation on the under 18s. So I think if the OHL had played this year, I really do think that he would have had a phenomenal season. And I think that it would have been capped off with or, or by the U18s and not necessarily being his, that being his starting point. So I think he's somebody that, I think still has a chance to squeak into the first round. I really do. But um, I think he would have been mentioned in that same sort of breath as those other two high-end goalies. Uh, the one from outside my region, uh, I'll give you another under-18s player for Canada, and that would be Owen Zellweger. I think that he played only a handful of games in the WHL this year before having to leave for the U18s. And at the U18s, I think we saw him really, really become more comfortable as that tournament went along. Uh, by the end of that tournament, he had replaced Brant Clark on that first power play unit. And I think that's something that we're not making uh, a big enough deal out of. I think that he is built for the modern day NHL, right? With his skating ability and the way that he sees the ice. Uh, and I think that he impressed a lot of people with his defensive capabilities at the U18s as well. And I think that if the WHL had had a full season, you know, and, and he was somebody who continued to be at about that point per game mark in the WHL and then had that fantastic under 18s. Again, I think we're mentioning him as, as a potential top 20 selection and not somebody who is sort of on that bubble for the first round or, or maybe more of an early second round selection. So I, I'm going to, before we get to a player who's maybe overrated going in this section, I want to throw it to you because obviously your job, your focus is the OHL and there was no Ontario hockey league season this year, which really stunk. Do you think that because there was no OHL season and not necessarily all players, because you have guys like Mason McTavish who went overseas to still play and get something on tape. Even Brant Clark went overseas to Slovakia to get some game on tape. Do you, as a, as a whole, do you think that, for players in the CHL, but OHL specifically, it's really hurting their draft stock that they didn't play this year and, and that they're being maybe pushed down draft boards to potential 
places where they could be a steal when you look back at the class in a few years? I think that's inevitable. I, I really do, unfortunately. Um, it runs the gamut, right? You have players who played in Europe uh, and then played at the U18s like McTavish. You have guys that played just at the U18s like Ethan Del Mastro or Ryan Winterton. You have some guys that played just at that Erie showcase this year, like say Ty Voigt. And then you have players like Connor Lockhart or Artem Rushnikov who didn't play a single game this year from this region. And how the NHL scouting staffs respond to that, uh, I don't know. And I think that's the biggest thing going into the draft. When you look at their livelihood being on the line based on these selections, right? Their reputation and their, um, you know, having their contracts renewed based on how well they do with these selections. Are they going to be willing to stick their neck out as much as they would based on a year old assessment? And I think that's something that we're going to have to wait and see. Uh, I really do think that we'll probably see quite a few uh, OHL players and Ontario based players go in that, you know, four five, six range more than we normally do. Just because like you said, teams are going to try to hit on that home run, right? Uh, I'll throw a guy like Ty Void at you from Sarnia. If the OHL plays this year. He very well could have been somebody we're talking about in the top 50 and realistically he's probably looking at at the latter half of the draft Connor Lockhart from Erie the same thing he was a really high OHL priority selection didn't even play this year uh so teams are going to look to to hit those home runs because you know that if the OHL played this year there would have been guys like a Zaid Wisdom or a Tyson Forrester who if we had based their assessments based on just their U17 season they might not even been drafted they might have been late round selections and then a year later, because development is not a linear process, um, they're high-end NHL draft picks and prospects, right? So there's going to be guys who slip through the cracks, unfortunately. And uh, I think the key is just for them to, to keep plugging away and for the OHL to return next year. And I think we're going to see probably a lot of kids get drafted in the second or third year of their eligibility, um, you know, in the 2022 draft, just by the nature of things. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement with you there. It's it's a double-edged sword. Like you mentioned, growth isn't always linear. You're going to have players who had maybe a less than stellar first year under 17 year in the Ontario Hockey League or CHL and that didn't get a chance really take a step forward. And you're going to have the opposite too. You're going to have players who really impressed during that first year, maybe not take that next leap forward, or maybe that's, you know, their development kind of gets capped at a certain point. So going back to this first round of the draft though, who do you see as someone who's been a little bit overrated, someone who's rising up the draft board who you think maybe shouldn't be where they are right now? Uh, I would say probably Daniel Cheka. Uh, I think that given the fact that he's one of the older players available this year, uh, I think he he didn't have a very good world junior championships. And I don't think that you can just base your, your only assessments on his performance there, because obviously he played in the KHL, he played in the MHL. We've got a few years of OHL service from him. Uh, so we have a pretty good idea of the type of player he is. I think there's some worry that his development has plateaued a little bit. Uh, I think, you know, you look at a kid who entered the OHL. Yes. He, he didn't play a lot in that first year, given how strong Guelph was. He played a lot on a forward actually to just to try to get in the lineup. But at the same time, he's always been one of those guys that's bigger and stronger than, than some of his uh, league mates, right? And I think that you have to wonder if this is a situation of, you know, does he project as a high-end NHL player? Does he project as an NHL player? Yeah, I think so. I think he's got a lot going for him. I think he's got a, a really big point shot. I think he skates well for his size. I think that there's a lot of potential for him to develop into a really strong defensive player. But do I see somebody who is going to be you know, a top three defender? No, uh, I don't. And when we're talking about him being a potential sort of top 20, top 25 selection, I think there's other defenders who I think have a higher upside that I'd probably target and not one that is maybe deemed a little bit more safe. I think if, if you're really looking at it, I mean, what is the difference between a guy like Cheka and somebody like Ethan Del Mastro and Jack Matier, who you know, are two other Ontario based players who probably have a similar projection, but you're going to be able to get them in the third, fourth round, probably maybe late second. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, if I'm using a first round pick on an offender, I want that person to have uh, a really high end projection uh, as a top three defender and somebody who can 
really make an impact both ways. And I, I don't know if I see that in Cheka. And I think that he's a very polarizing player too. I think you see some that have him sort of in that top 25 range. And then you see others who have him sort of more in that mid to late second round range. So we'll see where he, uh, where he ends up getting drafted, but he's sort of the first one that jumps out from that question. Yeah, and he's someone who's had a lot of team success too, right? Wins the OHL Cup with the Toronto Canadians uh, on that Guelph team. Like you said, maybe not the biggest role on that team, but on that Guelph team that wins the OHL championship in his first year. And then to kind of underwhelm at the World Juniors, I do think that I, I'm in agreement with you there where, you know, maybe you shouldn't base everything on it, but a little bit of a step back and you got to kind of reassess and say, okay, you know, forget all the, the team success and the strong teams he's played on. Now, where do we see this individual ending up? And Brock, I've got to commend you for the work that you've done, because as you've touched upon already, this has been a year unlike any other to track players, especially when your focus is the Ontario Hockey League. So maybe just let uh, the people watching know, how have you been able to navigate all of these massive roadblocks that have come in the way of evaluating Ontario Hockey League players in a year where there was no OHL season? So it's really incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's been tough, and I hope I don't have to do it again. Uh, I hope <laughs> we come back to the OHL playing next year so that we don't have to spend hours on hours watching video from players' U17 seasons to, to try to figure out how to grade them. Uh, obviously, I'm talking about my my role at McKean's, but you know, it's, it's not ideal. And in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's kind of unfair too. Like, like we talked about earlier, right. Uh, players go through growth spurts, players get stronger, players enter into the league in different situations. Uh, as you know, as somebody who's, who's covered the league, some players come in and they play four or five minutes a night on the fourth line, because the depth of that team that they're on is incredibly good and there's just no room for them to play more so there's not really an opportunity for them to showcase their abilities the way that they probably could whereas other players come into more of a rebuilding team and you know they get some power play time they get some time on the first or second line and they really get an opportunity to shine and um you know combing through video and trying to find highlights for for certain players even ones that we want to rank highly uh, is hard, especially when we talk about, say, a team like the London Knights, right? They've got a lot of players that are very intriguing options for, for the 2021 draft. Um, and trying to find really strong highlights for some of these players, it, it took a lot to try to sift through some of the video. And uh, a program like Instat, which is what we use at McKean's, has been an incredibly valuable resource because they they have pretty much video on, on everything. So we were able to watch uh, some of their European games. Uh, you know, the Erie Showcase, for example, was on it. Uh, and then obviously their, their U17 seasons, the last time the OHL played. So without a, a service like that or, or like something like Hockey TV, right, these types of services – it would have been very, very difficult, almost impossible even to, to do this sort of job that we did. Yeah. So got to commend you for everything that you've done and all the work that goes into it, because even in the, the most normal and regular of years, it's not an easy job and not easy to, you know, project where these players are going to go and how they're going to end up. So major kudos to the job that you and, you know, many others have had to do this year, but, you know, like I've said, Brock, I've always been a big fan of your work. Where can people go to find all of your latest work? Yeah, so two places. Uh, so OHL Prospects, which you talked about at the beginning, which has been my site or my blog that I've ran for uh, almost 15 years now, I guess, or I think we're like 12 or 13. So it's been long running. And then my work at McKean's, so McKean'sHockey.com. Uh, our draft guide recently came out. Uh, so there's a digital copy, which you can buy off the website or a, an actual print copy too, which you can also buy off the website. Uh, I would highly recommend both if you're a fan of the draft. Awesome, Brock. Thanks so much for taking the time to join the show and enjoy the draft. Now, <laughs> a lot of the hard work is, is, is kind of done. So take the time to enjoy the draft and see what happens next. Absolutely. Thanks, Stephen.